Hi, this is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening tips to improve our environment. Today, I am in beautiful Fairfax, Vermont, with Annie White. Annie is a PhD student at the University of Vermont in uh, ecological landscape design, and she's been doing some really interesting research um, on pollinators and the attractiveness of straight species native plants versus native cultivars to these pollinators. So, thanks so much for being here, Annie. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for making the trip up to beautiful Vermont. Was was not a hardship. So, Annie, tell me a little bit about how you came to do this research. Um, I worked on a lot of ecologically minded landscape design projects and um, loved using native plants for their benefits. And one thing that I started to notice more and more um, in the design field is that when I would come up with a plant list um, that I wanted to be installed on a project, um, let's say for a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden, um, and I would use native plants and I would specify the genus and species, and then that list would get handed over to a contractor. And more often than not, um, that contractor would go out and fulfill that plant order with cultivars because that seemed to be what was uh, most often available to them. And they seemed to think, well, it's the same genus and species, it must be the same. Um, and so that was something that was very concerning to me because it seemed like a lot of these cultivars, um, they certainly looked different. It seemed like they, they may have some different qualities and some different traits as the, the true natives or the straight species. Um, so that's something that just sparked a little interest in me and I tried to find some um, research out there that had looked at this topic and I couldn't find any. Um, so that made me think, well, someone really needs to do this research and I'd been interested in potentially going back to school and working on a PhD. And so I decided to um, take this project on myself and to um, come back to Vermont, which is where I grew up. Um, so it was exciting for me to study this um, right here in Vermont. And, th and this is the second year that you've been doing this research. And as I understand, you have two primary locations here in Fairfax at the Riverberry Farm, which is an organic farm. And, and where's the other location? Mm -hmm. Second location is in Maidstone, Vermont, which is in the very far northeast corner of the state. Um, it's a small, small town, a very rural agricultural community. And uh, my plot there is also at a, a small greenhouse business and small farm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And could you uh, share with us, you know, kind of some of the the general parameters of your research. What are you looking at specifically? Mm -hmm. The largest thing that I'm looking at is um, really looking at the attractiveness of the true species in comparison to a cultivar of the same species. And for, for those gardeners who might not understand the difference, could you make a quick definition of a straight species native versus a cultivar? Mm -hmm. So a straight species native would be um, the version of the native plant that has persisted in our landscape for hundreds of years. Um, it'd be a plant that I could go out and find a native population of, I could take that seed, I could propagate it. Um, they tend to be open pollinated, so they're going to um, be able to propagate true to species on their own in the wild. Um, a native cultivar is um, a native plant that's somehow been manipulated by humans in some way. So um, maybe it's just been a selection that somebody chose um, from a native population. So someone happens to spot a shorter Joe pie weed and says, boy, that would be great in the nursery trade. So we're going to select it and then we're going to propagate it to stay that size, right? Yep. Um, so that's one way a uh, native cultivar is derived. Um, sometimes they are deliberately then crossbred with each other. Um, uh, that's pretty common. Um, and oftentimes a, there's some crossbreeding that goes on in combination with selection. Um, sometimes a, a naturally occurring genetic mutation like a change of color might be selected for. Um, and occasionally we also do now see hybrids, um, which is a much more um, involved process that takes place in a plant lab. So your research on a high level took a look at pollinators and how attractive these different types of plants were, were to pollinators. So what are the pollinators that you're studying? Mm -hmm. I'm taking a look at all pollinators, um, which includes uh, different groups within the, the insect um, world, as well as um, hummingbirds, which I see very few, but um, I do record them as a, a present pollinator. So the, the largest groups of pollinators that I'm seeing, of course, are honeybees and bumblebees, um, a wide breadth of um, our native bees, 
Um, and you have about 275 species of native bees here in Vermont, is that correct? correct. That's correct, yes. Um, and also I look at, at bugs and beetles and moths and butterflies. Um, I classify those down to order. So I worked really hard to come up with a um, a list of pollinators that I can reasonably identify um, by sight in the field um, from often a meter or two away. So I can't identify down to species. I'm also not an insect taxonomist, so that's not um, my strength. And most people who are identifying pollinators down to species need to do so under a scope in a lab. So you're using uh, rather large groups then, and so explain what those groups are. Right. Um, so some um, bee pollinators, which I'm very interested in, um, can be identified down to species, which is the honeybee. The honeybee I can definitely identify um, from a meter or two away. Um, and then bumblebees. Um, we have um, between 12 and 20 species here in Vermont. Um, those I just keep in one group. I don't try to identify um, further to species because that can be difficult. Um, other bees that are very noticeable are green sweat bee, which is um, metallic green. So I have a, a group for that. Also our um, orchard bees or mason bees, which have a metallic blue color. I can note those. And then there's a lot of bees that fall into these kind of catch categories of large dark bees and small dark bees. Um, and then I have the insect order um, Coleoptera, which is our, our beetles and hemipteras, which are our bugs, and lepidopterans, which are all the moths and butterflies. Um, and I think I've covered everything in there. Okay, that's great. And so some high-level conclusions. You've been looking at the field now for uh, almost a full two summers. Are there any high-level conclusions that you can share? Yes, I think... Um, the, you know, the biggest conclusion that I can draw thus far is that there are differences and there are some sub substantial differences between a straight species of a native plant and a cultivar of a native plant. Um, some of these cultivars seem to uh, perform quite similarly and some um, do attract just as many pollinators um, and other cultivars um, do not and there's some pretty drastic differences. So I think uh, the big conclusion is that uh, we really need to just increase awareness about this. I think many people are not um, not educated about this topic or not even really aware that um, there are potential differences between a native cultivar and a native plant. Um, and the, the kind of the thing that I th really can conclude is that um, if you choose a cultivar, if you choose it, a cultivar that is as close to the straight species in terms of its color, its bloom time, its stature and form of the flower, um, it's more likely to be um, as beneficial as that straight species. I appreciate you saying that because I've been saying that just kind of from common sense for a long mm -hmm. time. I think if we stick with what looks like the straight species are in pretty good shape. If, but another approach is to read your research. So what I'd like to do now is actually go out in the field with you and take a look at some of these specimens. So Annie, talk a little bit about the methodology that you use to collect data on this. I see you've got a clipboard and a pen. How does this work? Okay, well here in my research plot, um, I have three replicates. So every group of um, six plants is replicated three times. So there's 18 plants of each um, either straight species or cultivar here. Um, and for my observations, I am um, each day that I come out, I, I observe um, which plants are at their peak bloom and which ones are coming into bloom and which ones are um, past their peak. And then I make a list of plants that I'm gonna observe that day. I then um, randomize uh, the order in which I'll observe each group of six plants. Um, and then I, I stand about a meter away from the plot. Okay, so you're not on top I, of the plants. So I'm not on top of the plants <laughs> okay. and hopefully not influencing the pollinators and their activity um, quite so much. Um, I try to wear um, colors that are not very attractive. Um, I also do not use white sheets because pollinators are very attractive to the color white. And I noticed that they were coming in and kind of buzzing my uh, my sheet here, so I switched to green paper. Um, and then for five minutes, um, I start my little timer for five minutes, and I observe all of the pollinator visits. So every pollinator that comes and, and lands on a flower, um, and I observe um, every flower visit 
Um, so if a pollinator flies out of the patch and then comes back, they may be counted twice, but there's really no way to um, assure that that's not happening. Um, and so I just record everything for the five minutes and then I move on to the, the next mm -hmm. plot. Um, sometimes when there's a lot of activity, like here with the Hellenium now, um, I may only be able to observe maybe two of the six plants mm -hmm. for five minutes because there might just be um, so much going on I can't get an accurate count. So when you decide um, about weather conditions, are you actually coming out on cloudy and rainy days as well or do you stick to the sunny times? Uh, last summer when I started collecting data, I had a very um, strict criteria. I wanted the weather to be warmer than 60 degrees Fahrenheit, less than 50% cloud cover. Um, I wanted wind to be less than 10 miles per hour. Um, and then this summer I've actually been more lenient on that because I thought it would be interesting to see which pollinators are flying in less ideal conditions. Um, so I don't come out on rainy days because I know there won't be any activity. Um, but I do come out on cloudy days and in varying um, temperatures and wind speeds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's take a look at some more plants. Watch more clips of Annie White's research on pollinators and native plants on the Eco Beneficial YouTube channel. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful gardening tips to improve our environment, please visit us at www.ecobeneficial.com.